Welcome to Parentless Podcast. Please note that in this show, you may hear graphic descriptions or language that may not be appropriate for everyone. Listener discretion advised. When I think about my dad, I think about his hands. He talked with his hands. He had these extraordinary, like big ears, Irish ears. So I have lots of images of him. When he was not doing anything, but maybe also not doing the right thing, like maybe sneaking cookies from the cupboard or something, he would like kind of croon. He'd be, he'd boo, 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 like that kind of thing. If you'd like to support the show and have access to exclusive content, please visit www.patreon.com slash parentless podcast. So my name is Megan Reardon Jarvis. I am a psychotherapist based in Washington, D.C., and I've been a trauma and grief-informed therapist for about 20 years. I have a husband, a dog, three kids, and I'm also a writer. I'm a recent new um, writing, writing through grief proponent, and I run a, a grief workshop, a grief writing workshop through my blog and website, Grief is My Side Hustle. And it's a free workshop that's sort of more therapeutic in nature than it presents itself. This is a fact in the ducks on your study. She says some things that I don't love, but I don't love them gently. I feel like they're well-informed. She's also a clinician, is Megan Devine. She wrote, it's okay, you're not okay. She she also has a, I I took it because again, like my way of doing it is like consuming everything there is out there. Her her grief group is, it's monitored by therapists. It's better than most. It's not, there's no cohesive, it's just every day you're getting another thing to do. It doesn't, it doesn't help you progress. But I, again, I don't think she's been a clinician in a long time. I think she's been doing the talking about it for a long time. And her per- personality is very sincere. So I find that off-putting. I like a little like snark in my, in my, you know, a, a little humor. And she doesn't really have that. Um, but her book is, a, is the book when people are like, if you had to give one book, that's the book I would give. That and Kelly Corrigan's Tell Me About It, which is a is the story of losing her best friend to cancer and her father all in the same year. And it's just it, it's all it's it's all the truth there is to tell in two different books. Those are the ones that I think are the best. So when people ask me, like, okay, just cull it down. I mean, I have multiple copies of those books. And, you know, I wouldn't publish Megan's book without editing a few things, but it's the best thing out there that I can find. Okay. I haven't read that. Um, I've heard of it a little bit, but she has a good, if you thought you can just follow her on Instagram, everything that's in the book is on Instagram. She, she, you know, she, again, like she's made this her life work and it's how she makes her money. So she has a really nice series of prompts. I mean, it's, you know, series of things on Instagram that pop up pretty regularly. And then her writing is on there too. And it's, it's good. It, it really is good. And she was involved in Speaking Grief. I'll send you this stuff. The Speaking Grief documentary is really good. Oddly, you know, I think they had an opportunity that they missed, which is when I talked to the producer that last fall when they were still filming, she made it sort of clear to me that they were they were funded for a certain portion, which was to make the film. And then then there was another portion. And so they're in the second portion. But I feel like they were it's almost like there were two different jobs being done. The film, creating the film and then the promotion of the film. And it's unfortunate that the promotion comes at a time when people are not able to gather and connect because it's a it's a good it's a really it's moving. It's really moving. And they've done a good job of like finding, you know, same sex couples, people of different ethnicities, people of different abilities. It's, it's a, it's a well put together film. 
but the person that I think does the best is Liz Gleason. She is, she's funny. She's sharp as anything and she knows everything. I mean, I, you know, she's not a trauma therapist, but there's nothing on there that I've heard her say where I'm like, yeah, that's not right. And you know, she just, she knows it all. She's a, she's a, she's a bereavement counselor and she's got a great accent. So I'll send you the accents. Yeah. We'll take the accents. I'm a sucker for an accent, obviously. Mm -hmm. So what episode, I know that you talked to her, you had, you had an episode with her. So which one is yours? I don't even know. It's trauma. It's, it's, um, traumatic grief. I have to look it up. Let me see. But there's a picture of me. Okay. But she, she had wanted me to talk about traumatic grief. So it's a good episode, I think, because it's, again, it's sort of the blend between the clinical stuff and the personal together, which, you know, I don't think anybody gets into talking, you know, about grief unless there's a reason that you care about it. And it's interesting when my husband and I got married, we got married in an Episcopal church because at the time I was, I was an Episcopal and I don't really have a country for religion at the moment, but the priest who was a good friend of mine and really cared about us, his sermon at our wedding was like, I mean, people were, there were audible gasps. I mean, he knew us really well, but what he said was, Getting married makes no sense. It makes no logical sense. What will happen as you bind each other, bind to each other in this commitment is the inevitable heartbreak of one of you losing the other. I mean, that was literally what he said. And people were like, Ugh! and I, it was so beautiful. I mean, it was so beautiful. It was, you know, if you were, if you were playing it safe, you wouldn't do this. You're doing it you know, out of love. And we know that love causes tremendous pain. And I think about that a lot. I mean, I think about it because people bring it up because it really was a very remarkable sermon. And so people bring it up to me often, either saying I loved it or I hated it. But also it's so interesting to me that in the, in the seminal events of my life, like getting married, where I chose to go to college, um, when I had my babies, that there's, there are elements in there that are all connected to grief, that there's grief that's sort of tattooed across all of my life experience. And that's probably true of everyone, right? Like we're always losing something, but it's interesting to me that now, you know, it really is like my mission to help the planet acclimate to this new experience of being overwhelmed by loss as best as I can help. But also that, you know, there are going to be more people like me where, you know, grief is just, it's part of what we've been acclimating to our whole lives. Yep. And we, we know that we all have to deal with it at some point anyway. And now you've already pointed out that it's going to be much more massive. So we're seeing it now. Definitely now is a time to do something for sure. Because yeah, and one of the, you know, there's a lot of wringing of hands of like, Oh my God, what is going to happen? Like how, you know, how are we going to help these people? And you know, Again, I think there's a whole cohort of people for whom grief will just be a natural process and they'll be okay. So the fact that we have this trauma of COVID doesn't mean that everyone's going to be traumatized, but the ones who are traumatized are already the ones that had something difficult and they'll deal with trauma the way we deal with trauma, which is all the process disorders of like alcoholism and over shopping and overeating. And oh, so if we don't deal with it on the front end, we're going to deal with it on the back end when we're treating them for alcoholism or we're bailing them out with the, you know, when they go into bankruptcy or when they're, you know, sex addicts and they get fired from their jobs. Like we, we don't want anyone to have to invent their own way to soothe themselves when we could provide psychoeducation and support to do that. So, I mean, I wrote an op-ed a while ago that didn't really go anywhere, but I, you know, that was just sort of like when Biden comes in, I hope he adds a grief czar to his administration. I hope he gets all the smartest voices from universities. And, you know, there are people that study grief all over the world. I hope he gets those folks and has them, you know, create the, a public health effort in this country to support all the people who are going to need the new sport, mm. but the New York times didn't want to publish it. So it's just me, you and I that know about that op-ed right now. I don't think Biden's listening. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, I, before I let you get too far with your knowledge that you want to share with us, I do want to talk a little bit about you. So first of all, when we talk about people, sometimes I get too invested in the person and I forget to ask 
who who they were. So can you tell me what your dad's name is? Sure. John Reardon. It's R-I-O-R-D-A-N. What's your mom's name? Mary. And, and so so with that question, I guess, and, and you um, are working to make people or help people be grief informed. So if I come to you and you have just lost someone, what what should I say to you? What's the best, the most helpful thing that I can do for you at this time? You know, it, that's awesome. God, I love that question. And and again, if, you know, any of the places that we just talked about, you look at anybody's website and they're going to say, here are the things that you don't say and here are the things that you should say. And I, I actually don't believe in that. What I believe is if you go to your, your real place, your core truth and ask questions from that, what are you curious about? You know, do you want to know about my dad? Like, Oh, what kind of a man was your dad? Where did your dad grow up? Was he first generation American? Ask those things. I feel like you can't go wrong if you ask questions. And so on my website, I have, you know, eight questions and the questions are, are you sleeping? Are you eating? Do you have a faith base that helps you, you know, navigate grief? You know, is there a a time of day that's difficult? Like there's a bunch of questions that if you can't think of anything, ask one of Megan's questions. And I've had clinicians come back to me because it's so awkward. You find yourself in a room with someone that, you know, just lost their dad And you're like, shit, I don't want to talk to them. I don't know what to do because I don't know how to do this. And, you know, that's also true when you're like, you have a crush on someone, but nobody says like, okay, well, you feel really awkward. Just leave. Don't say anything. Like you push yourself forward. So I give people these, you know what, just go to Megan's website. You can look at these questions, have these in your back pocket, ask these. And the good thing about questions is if the person does not want to talk about it, which is what everyone worries about, everyone worries. I don't want to bring it up because I don't want to upset them. They can choose to not talk about it. Hey, I was just curious, like, how are you doing? Are you sleeping at all? You know what? I'm good. Thank you for asking. You will hear it. They don't want to talk about this. They don't want to know. They don't. You're out. Or God, thank you for asking. I'm a wreck. I can't believe I'm here. You know, I had to slap on four coats of mascara because all it is, is like the way that I think about it is I spent a lot of time in New York is like, you know, when you're in, you're like a pregnant lady in New York or an old lady in New York comes onto the train and everyone acts like they didn't see them. Like, come on, you assholes. Yes, you did. And if you saw them, and you're not making room, why can't you make room for them? Why? Like, do you need that chair so bad? And if you need that chair so bad, maybe that's okay. But even if they, even if you just slide over and they can then be like, no, I'm good. I don't need to sit down. That is huge, right? Like you don't need to sit down. You don't want to sit down. That's cool. I just wanted you to know that I'm, there's room here for you to sit down. And so I think of that as like cocktail party, church, you know, family reunion. You can do that. How are you doing this? You know, how are you doing? So that's what I want people to to do is find a question that is authentic to you and ask it. If you're curious, like, hey, you know, how are your dad's brothers doing? You can ask. I wouldn't ask that the first thing I would always ask about the griever, always let them know that you see them and that you can see their grief, even though they may be choosing to hide it. And, you know, I've had so many people call me and say, oh, my God, Megan, I I went to back to school night and that lady whose husband just died was there and I didn't say anything. And the thing is, you can just send them a text or an email. I'm so sorry. I had all I felt all kinds of weird ways and I should have said something to you or I wish I'd said something to you. And the people are like, I feel all kinds of ways too. Thank you for telling me. But you, there's no such thing as like a totally missed opportunity. Ask a question, let them know you care. Even if that's all you say, my little sister is really great at this. (laughs) You know, people say like, oh, I didn't want to call and disturb you. I didn't want to call and upset you. And my little sister will call and say like, I assumed you wouldn't pick up if you didn't want to talk to me. And I kind of feel like nothing I can say can make it worse. So it's a good time to call. And I just love that, which is, you know, I can, I can show up. And what I think is also important about being a supporter or someone who's curious is to also know, you know, your curiosity is not more important than the person's experience, that your job is to be sure that you do the best you can to be helpful to the person who has the need not to meet your own needs. 
So yeah, I had a conversation with someone recently and they were, you know, my big thing is like, I don't want to hear that my mom is an angel in heaven because I just don't believe that. And so when her really deeply religious friends say that to me, I say back to them, I know that brings you comfort. I don't believe that. So it doesn't bring me comfort. And I believe your intention is to make me feel good. And that's making me feel bad. And then, you know, I'll say, but I'm open to anything else. Like, if you want to tell me something else, you can tell me a great story about my mom. Like, I love that, too. But people trying to provide me comfort, is that's not their job. They can't do it. So I, you know, what I when people say, what should I do? Go close, step close, ask a question. If the person doesn't want you close, you will know it. And then step back. Check your motivation. Are you are you stepping close because you're curious or interested in this? Or because you believe that you want to extend your compassion to this person. If it's the first, do not do it. You know, I I had a friend commit suicide, I guess it's oh, 10 days ago now. And it's been, you know, as brutal as it sounds. And the family has chosen to be really private about the fact that it was a suicide. But it's obvious when you read an obituary in a you know, a young woman dies and then no one mentions anything. It's the first thing that everybody wonders about. And so as a mental health professional, I'm like, damn it, I wish I wish they could have figured that out differently because it creates shame when, you know, if she had died of like a diabetic, you know, issue, it would have said she died of complications of diabetes. So the fact that she died the way that she died generates a lot of curiosity from people. And I don't blame that, you know, I don't blame anybody for being curious or wondering or being concerned, but you do not step to the primary grievers and ask that question. How did she, how did she die? If you already have an edge on it, ask, ask a friend, ask somebody else, ask her roommate from college. Do not ask a family or a primary group. If you're kind of, you know, Nora McInerney, who has a wonderful podcast called Terrible Things for Asking, um, which is another good one, by the way. Uh, she calls that grief adjacent. If you're grief ad- adjacent, you need to know that you're grief adjacent. You have your own experience, but you are not the primary grievers and you need to behave accordingly, which is important. It's really important. There's a there's a devastating play that's it would still be on Broadway if Broadway was open called Dear Evan Hansen, which is about a teenager committing suicide and the fallout of people drawing attention to themselves as being connected to that suicide when they weren't. And that, you know, that you forgive everyone in the play because it's so heart wrenching. It's beautiful. The music, beautiful. And they're teenagers. But when we're grown ups, you know, we have to be able to do better and not, um, not have our own motives be the things that are the most important. Yeah, I've been really kind of rethinking the the way that I like to ask my questions is very straightforward because this is a topic that people like to shy away from. But sometimes I feel like it might come across as, well, I'm really interested in how they died because that's that's what I ask first. And then we go into everything else. But so that's some stuff that I'm thinking about. But I feel like it's their whole story and we need to tell the story as well. I don't think it's inappropriate to ask how someone died, but I wouldn't ask it as the lead, not because I think there's a right or wrong, but because, uh, you know, I had a neighbor who was like, I, I mean, I'm so, I'm so like out there and straightforward, you know, somebody I sort of casually know from the community pool who said, who sent me a really loving text after my mom died and said, let me know if you want to like take a walk or get a glass of wine. And I wrote back, like, we have never taken a walk before and ha- or like had a drink together. Why, why would the fact that my mom died suddenly make me of more interest to you in that way? So, you know, I, I mean, I didn't say it quite as shitty as I just said it just now, but you know, that it didn't feel great when she was like, do you want, you know, would you want me to come over and help you? It's like, why would I, I'm not totally isolated. I have family and friends. And also why is that the most interesting thing? Like you didn't come over to ask me about my job or about my, you know, new lawn care. It's, and I know it's well-intended. I mean, the phrase that I use all the time is I know you mean that with love. So like, I want you to know that your intention has gotten across because what happens for people who are trying to show up well is they get their feelings hurt. I was trying to be loving to Megan and she got upset and now I'm mad at her, even though her mother died. 
So what I try as a griever to say is, I know your, I see your intention. I feel it. It is not working. It's like a button that is not snapping. What else can you do? What else do you have? I'm not trying to be crappy. You know, that's a lot to ask a griever when they're really in fresh grief. They might not be able to do that, but I think we're entitled to do it. So I think you're safer asking about the person, the griever, than any of the specifics. And I think a simple way to ask about them is to ask about the things that we concretely know are difficult when you're grieving. Eating, sleeping, are I'm either eating too much or I'm sleeping all the time or I can't sleep at all and I can't eat anything. Those are the ones that I would start with. The, my follow-up one always is, do you have any religious background or faith base that helps you navigate this really difficult space? Did you grow up with any like God stuff or, you know, does that help? Does it make it worse? Then I ask the question, like, is there anybody that really is like just nailing it, like really helping really, you know, do you have like a best friend? Are they doing, cause you know what? Sometimes the best friend is a nightmare. Like, no, my best friend is a nightmare. They're, they're doing all the wrong things and they're making me want to kill myself. But my roommate from college who I haven't spoken to in 14 years, weirdly, because her mom died, she's been really helpful. So it's a way of like talking about yourself without having to go into the grief experience that, you know, I think of active grief as sort of like a Halloween costume, like a Spider-Man costume, like it's thin and it's clingy. And when I put it on, I'm in it. And I don't want to at back to school night be in my grief, but I might want to reference it. Like, no, that Halloween costume is, is I wear that every day. I don't have it on right now. It's really uncomfortable. I don't sleep. I don't eat. I wish I didn't have to wear it. So it's like talking from your grief while you're in it versus talking about your grief. And so the questions that I offer people are to help talk about your grief. And that, you know, what is it like to wear that costume? It's really hard. That's it. That's, that is, you, I feel like you can't lose if you ask someone about themselves and reference the fact that you know that they're grieving and then it may become a larger conversation, but that's the entry point. You know, does that make sense? It's like the, it's the way in and, and lots of grievers, you know, the, our, everyone's big concern is I don't, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to make them feel bad. You're not going to make them feel bad. You're either going to be sliding down so that they can sit down next to you and you'll let them know that there's room for them to sit here with their feelings or they don't want to sit down. They don't want to have these feelings. And it doesn't matter what you ask. They are going to keep themselves contained and not get into it with you. And I think that's, you know, I think it's important. And the other thing that I say to people, you know, there's fresh grief is that like everybody's overwhelmed and really discombobulated and not feeling well and um, are really sick with the early stages of grief as that begins to subside and people, you know, I always say like, if I have lipstick on or my buttons and my buttons are done up, right. People sometimes forget that this is something I'm still navigating every damn day. I, as soon as someone says to me, this is what's going on for them. I put like, I don't know, 20 days from now, I put a reminder in my phone. I'm going to check in with that person. And my check-ins are just want you to know I was thinking about you today. That's it. Just wanted you to know. I put their anniversaries in there. I check in around the holidays. I mean, I have a list of people in my notes that are like, these are people for whom the holidays may be hard. And that, when people do that, it is, oh my God, it's like telling them that you can see them in a world that implies they're invisible. It's just game changing. And, and you know, these are not, these are not secrets. Everyone has a phone with a reminder. Everyone, everyone can do it. It's not that hard. Yeah, I like I like all of what you've shared. And I really, you keep getting away from me on your point. I love it for the information, but I don't want to let you get away without these answers. So yeah, tell me. What, it, like, did your mom have a saying or anything that she said, you know, a lot or anything that just really reminds you of her when you hear it? Oh my God, so many things. I mean, I mentioned before my mom, that my mom was so funny. So she used to do two things. One was you would say like, you're standing outside. We grew up in New England and I'd be like, oh, I'm chilly. And my mom would stick her hand out and say, oh, hi, chilly. I'm Mary. And she just thought that joke was so funny. 
Um, she did a lot. And then, you know, when we were younger, my mom was more serious and didn't swear and didn't, um, you know, she was just like, you know, a young woman trying to raise her kids. Right. And as we grew older, she swore a lot and she, you know, would tell irreverent stories. And so one thing that was, she had, she just couldn't keep the, the words bullshit and shit face straight. So she would say that when she was really mad about something for a year, she was on the library board in our town and they were like a bunch of lunatics. And so she would say, Oh man, I went to the meeting and I was just so shit faced. And I'm like, that's drunk. mom. You were drunk. <laughs> and that, I mean, after a while, I think she did it on purpose, but, but I just loved that about, and she'd go, Oh, Oh, did I, which one did I say? The one where I was mad or the one where I was drunk? <laughs> And she did, you know, she had a way of like doing a very, like a sweet little kid kind of voice when she was, you know, excited about something. The other thing, and I was thinking about it today because it's really cold in here in D.C. I mean, it's cold in the whole Northeast, I think. But her mother and grandmother used to use this phrase, which to me just seemed so incongruous with my mother because she, you know, we didn't like talk about body, body parts or sex or any of those things, but she would, when it was really cold, she would say, it's colder than a witch's tit. <laughs> I've never heard it before. I've never heard it since. My mother is the only person who I've ever, but she said it all the time. <laughs> and so, yeah, those are phrases that just recently I mean, there's probably a thousand, but those are ones that make me think of her. And it's it's not surprising. I love the question. It's such a nice interview question because it makes me laugh and it makes me think of who she was and her personality. But she was a really she was just a funny lady. She really was. And just from your post, I guess I shouldn't assume anything, but you seem like a very involved mom and just like. I would like to be like you. Um, so you had to learn. I mean, I, I just feel like your mom was probably just a great mom for you. She was a great. I mean, my mom was 19 when she had her first kid. So she grew up learning how to be a mom. And I would I what I would say is when we were younger and there were a lot of kids in the house. I felt like there wasn't a lot of room to need from her. She seemed kind of overwhelmed and pretty formal and strict. And then when I was in my early 20s, I really was like trying to create my own way forward, which is much more, you know, talk therapy, say the truth, live out loud, do what you want to do, um, be with who you want to be with. And I don't think my mom would have stopped me from doing any of those things. But I had, you know, I, I pushed away a bit from her. We went through this period where anytime she said something I didn't like, it was like when I was early in therapy, I would just hang up on her because I was I was not really able to, like, confront her about things yet. So I'd just hang up on her, um, which was terrible. I feel terrible about that now. There's so many things about being a parent where I'm like, oh, my God, I need to apologize for all those things. Or, like, how did she feed us? There was no microphone away when I was a kid. But as I became a mom and my younger sister said this to me too, I, things just sort of like, I, I am a generally really happy, content person. And there was something about becoming a parent for me that made me looser and less edgy and more content and happy. And I think, um, my mom and I really enjoyed the last, you know, 15 years of my life that there was a lot to talk about. I mean, she spent most of her adult life as a parent. So there were a lot of times where I'd be like, mom, I don't know about my job and this. And she would say things like, well, when I was your age, I had three kids. So there was a lot of, a lot of time where like, we just, it, we were not that relatable to each other, but when we had children, we were really relatable to each other. And I think there's a lot of a lot of stuff that falls away in how you compare yourself to others or what you're anxious about when you have kids. There's such a relief in having something that matters more to you than maybe you to focus on. I made more sense to her, I think, when I was a mom. And she was a complete delight in um, and actually, I, I, there was someone on your podcast that talked about this, just the idea that like, my mom cared about anything I asked her to care about. 
anything. It didn't matter what it was. I could be talking about fabric for a chair and she would like just thrill in the idea that I had managed to talk the manager down to a discounted price. I mean, she, her phrase was, I'd call her and be like, okay, do you want an update on the, you know, the preschool situation? And she'd say, let me get my tea. Let me get my tea. And she would just sit and care. And in all honesty, you know, she didn't, always agree with my choices. And I don't know that she always thought that I was doing the right thing, even as a parent, but she was a participant in the conversation of everything that mattered. And that, I, you know, that's, that is why it was traumatizing to lose her because you never don't need that. You never, you, you know, there's, I, I'll, I'll miss that for the rest of my life. I'll miss her for the rest of my life because as long as that woman took breath, she was going to care about all the things that I asked her to care about as an extension of her love for me, which as a parent, that makes total sense to me. You know, my kids like care about video games that I don't even know what they are, but I'm like, Oh my God, you got a 79. You're so, that's so great. I don't even know what I'm talking about, but I really do care because they're my kids and they are running up the stairs to tell me they're excited about something. Right. Being your number one fan. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's exactly right. Um, so with that, is there anything, what would you, what would you tell your mom today? If you could, if you could tell her whatever you wanted. Mm. It's interesting. I always think when people say, you know, you can sit with someone and talk to them and I, I don't, I actually don't think there's anything left unsaid between me and either of my parents. I don't think there's any, um, I don't know if my dad would say that my dad really wanted to say some things to me as he was dying that I kept telling him he didn't need to say, I didn't need confessions from him. I totally, or, or absolution or apologies. I really, I really, I already understood exactly who he was and loved him just as he was. So it was important to me to show up that way. I mean, I, I think, I think what I would say to my mom is that I miss her and she would know that. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't surprise her that she would know. Mm -hmm. And do you feel, I mean, like you've already said about, you know, your, your spirituality and things like that, that, you know, some people believe that, that they're up, up there looking down on us. Do you, what's your belief in that? I wish I believed in that. What, what's your alternative? I feel like this is going to be a work in progress for me. It's what's, what's really interesting is that I have a lot of trauma around religion. I was raised in one of the churches in Boston that had a pedophile priest and, which didn't come out until I was in my early twenties. And there's just a lot of like organized religion garbage. That's really, really hard. I do. And I have been working through this and, and writing a lot about it. I actually do really believe in God. I believe that that sensation that I had in my body when, when I told you that I knew that my mom died, I believe that is the energy of God, but that's about as much as I can tell you. Cause I, I haven't, I have so much, organized religion that obscures like my own access to my own understanding that that's, I'm hoping that's going to be the next, you know, 10 years of practice is coming to understand my, I have watched some other people do that, you know, women that I really admire to come to their own understanding outside of religion. So I'm hoping that I, that I get to work on them that, that next, I actually think that, that when people die, they die. And I think their energy is released into the world. You know, I think my mother's footprints, uh, her, like, you know, 25 years of her energy is in the earth by her house. And I believe that I believe that I have her energy inside me, both in my DNA and in, you know, in that that's literally what happens when someone dies is their energy goes back into the earth. But that's about as far as I've gotten I, you know, I would love to believe that she's trying to send me messages. She and I would laugh so hard about after my dad died, we got these cards that said like, you know, when you see a butterfly, you know, you'll think of him in the, you know, the wind in his wings or something. And like, that is not who my, my dad is not coming back as a butterfly. Like he might come back as a traffic jam, but he's not coming back as a butterfly or a hurricane or something. So we laughed a lot about that. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't think, I, I don't expect it. You know, I, I, there are times where I write about things and people are like, that's your mom. She was coming through for you. And 
but having said that, I, I am because I'm super curious about it. I am going to do a, a, a medium reading because I really do believe in the energy of things. I just don't know that I believe that like she gets to stay a contained being who can communicate. And when I see a butterfly and people say, oh, you know, that was my mom visiting me. I think it's just a memory or a belief. It's just me activating my love for her and thinking, God, maybe, you know, wouldn't it be cool if she was a butterfly? But I don't know. Talk to me in three years and I'll tell you where I've gotten with it. My mom absolutely believed in heaven, absolutely believed in angels, absolutely believed that people intervened on her behalf and interceded for her. She talked to my dad every day after he died and believed that they were communicating. I mean, I just feel wildly jealous of that. That sounds great. Who the hell wouldn't want that? I mean, (laughs) that sounds great. I just can't feel that. So I can't believe in things that I can't feel. My husband said this really lovely thing because we, you know, he's just such a good guy. He wasn't, he wasn't raised with any of the sort of constructs about what should or shouldn't happen after life. And so I said to him, like, what do you think? Like, what do you, you know, just tell me what you think. And he said, and he said this thing that like, if I were going to get to believe in anything, I like this one the most, which is that maybe you get what you believe in when you die. That if you believe in heaven, that's what you get. And it's populated with all the people that you want to be there because why couldn't it be? And that if you believe in reincarnation, then that's what you get. And if you believe in nothing, then that's what you get. And not as a punishment, but just you get that maybe that is the gift of death is that you get what you believe in. And I love that idea. I just, because I I would love for my mom to get what she believed. She really believed that she was going to be reunited with people that she adored and loved. And I, I hope that's true. Yeah, I kind of was wondering. Um, I've never heard that that outlook, so I like it as well. But I was wondering, like, how your feelings were knowing that you have a different belief than your mom. And maybe she's not really where she, you know, according to your belief, she may or may not be where she wanted to be. So, yeah, I mean, I yeah, it I mean, according to my belief, she's not really anything conscious or in formalized existence anymore. So that would that would be OK with me if that is the way that it is. That's okay. But, you know, the same way I I have a good friend whose mother-in-law died really young and, you know, she just says over and over again, like, I'm just so sad she didn't get to live this part of her life and see these things and enjoy these things. And, you know, the way that I feel about it right now, and I mean this really sincerely, like I've already had so much more life that was so good than I ever expected that if I were to die tomorrow, I would be okay. Like this is, I won the fucking lottery when it comes to my life. I would feel terrible for my children. I would feel terrible for my husband. That is the part that, I, you know, makes me rock back and forth in the corner when I fear things like COVID. But, you know, I think my mom, if, if she doesn't get anything else, she would have been fine. If, you know, she, she liked her life a lot. She was pretty content. And the part that I didn't mention is she did, she did die this gorgeous death which is she had seen all of her children, which is pretty extraordinary because we are spread all over the place. But she had recently been to Seattle to see my sister, her oldest daughter, my oldest sister. We'd gone to Maine to see my brother. She had seen her own brother in Seattle only because she had gone out to my niece's graduation. And the rest of my siblings had been to her home to visit because I was there. So in the week that she died, she had in the in the month that she died, she had seen everybody that was directly blood related to her. And then, you know, she went to bed and died in her sleep holding a rosary in her favorite pajamas. Like that's, you know, and she talked to a friend the night before and she even though we fought about it, she went and visited the Monsignor, who was a really good friend of hers. And he blessed her before she left. Like you can't it was I have a chapter in the book that I'm writing that's the, called The Most Beautiful Death That Ever Was. I mean, it, you can't get any better than that. And what's, you know, part of the reason I write about it is it still traumatized me. You know, you can't, when people are like, oh, if only my dad had lived for whatever, or if only he, if my mom hadn't had to suffer. It's like my mom literally had the most beautiful death a human could ask for. And it was still the worst. <laughs> It was the worst, but, you know, I had to be hospitalized. That's how, ho- that's how hard it was. This yeah. is really not about the death. It's about the loss. Yeah. And what you said, you know, we all, we all have loss, but we experience it in different ways. Yeah. Definitely. For sure. 
Yeah, that's so. it's absolutely true. So we talked about your mom a little bit. Some of those things. Did your dad have a, a saying or anything that reminds you of him? Also, we talk about, you know, mm. the smell, sight, taste, sound. I, my dad is really visceral for me. Like when I think about my dad, I think about his hands. He talked with his hands. He had these extraordinary, like big ears, Irish ears. So I have lots of images of him. He, when he was not doing anything, but maybe also not doing the right thing, like maybe sneaking cookies from the cupboard or something, he would like kind of croon. He'd be, he'd boo, 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 like that kind of thing. So I think about that a lot and I do that a little bit myself now, which I never did before. And I have heard some other people do that. And it's, I just have like a real affection for, for that. The thing that my dad said to me in my, in my adult life, which almost felt incongruous to how I was raised is he said, don't take, don't chase other people's joy. Other people's happy is theirs. You have to find your own, which I just love that. I mean, I just, if, if you were going to ask me something that I 100% believe to be true of the human experience, it is that. And I think, you know, my dad lived, he grew up in near poverty and, you know, built himself into the man that he was. And so I think he learned that lesson the hard way. I think he assumed that people who had certain things or access to certain things were happy. And I think he came to understand that like, it, that's not how happy works. So I really always appreciated that like piece of advice from him is, you know, don't chase someone else's happy. Don't go to law school because other people think that law school is a thing to do. Like go to law school because you think that's going to make you happy. Was he a lawyer? No, he wasn't. No, my dad was an interesting guy. He published um, textbooks for a while. Um, he was brilliant. He spoke five different languages. And um, he ended up working at a trade association that took advantage, you know, that really sh it, his international interests and his ability to use his language and his huge, unbelievable brain. Um, he ended up working there and then retiring from there. And he loved it. I mean, he it was his... It was his clubhouse. So you said your dad had a very large brain, very smart. Um, do you yeah. feel like you, you get that from him? I mean, with your work, you can't, you, you've got to have a large brain as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm nowhere near. My dad was like, you know, genius level. I, I, there, what, I, what I did get from my dad is a work ethic. I mean, he taught us to work really hard. And my, both of my parents had really high expectations about that. And, and, and did things that I value and find hard to do, like not overindulge us and expect us to, you know, work for our own money and to put our own talents to, you know, they, they would never have called the school on our behalf. They would have expected us to advocate for ourselves. And, you know, most of everybody in my family has professional jobs and are, you know, financially comfortable and are good relationships. And so... If you ask my therapists, they would be able to tell you terrible things about my parents because that's what you do in therapy. My dad was a was a very he had a lot he had high expectations and of himself and us. People talk about feeling guilt or feeling regret, which are not the same word, but they're similar. And um, I just really feel like it is important to tell people that that is that you know that is part of grief, like being nervous before giving a speech. Even people who have given speech, you know, like even Steven Spielberg is ner a little nervous about giving a speech. It's just the natural reaction to standing in front of a very big crowd. That is also true with grief that we we regret and we feel some guilt about things we either did or didn't do. And that's part of the grief process. Nobody gets no one doesn't have that. And I loved how you said regret is the human experience of grief. Is that the right way? Probably. That sounds like what I said. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, that was really nice. I like that. So I don't know. I just, I loved everything you've shared. I know that you have so much more to share and you've got your books coming out and you're writing your, um, I intended to be more active in the writing, but that didn't yeah. happen. So I'm joining again. Awesome. And good, hopefully. Good, good. I'm hoping that we're going to have another good group. I'm just going to keep doing it as long as there's interest. So uh, it's interesting because they were like, 150 people on a waiting list and I put this out. Maybe I put it out too early. I'm still learning the whole process, but people haven't signed up as quickly. So I'm still trying to figure that out. So it may be a smaller group. I don't know. I mean, it, it's more than a week. It's two weeks before it starts. So we'll just, we'll just have to see 
but I'm excited about it. I have some prompts and some ideas about how I want to share things. And it's been really good for me. So February 8th, the prompts come out. And, you know, it really is designed that I deliberately, there's some, there's some formats where every day you get a new prompt. It's deliberately designed so that you have a day in between to sort of catch up, skip one. And then I give sort of a, a meteor prompt on a Friday so that you have some time to go, you know, spend some time with it if you want to. But they're, you know, if you do them, great. If you don't do them, they're there and they'll stay there so people can come through. I'm, I'm hoping to get it in workbook form because I think there are some people. I mean, I'm one of those. I write everything out by hand before I type it. So I like the idea of taking the images and being able to give it to people in a workbook form so that they can do it at their own pace at the beach without their device. I think that'd be great. So we'll see. There's a, there's a, there's a lot of, a lot of um, paperwork and other people to talk to when, when you do it that way, but I think it could be good. Grief is my side hustle. Come, come find it. There's you, people can just come and read what I've written, they can come look at resources. There's actually, it, right now it's just a blog and it's about to turn into an interactive website. So it'll just shift. It's The format will look different. It'll have all the same stuff, but it'll have a lot more on there, including um, a whole bunch of stuff about grief mates, which is the, which is the writing group. Awesome. Yeah. That's so good. I'm so glad to have you here with me today. Thank you. Thanks for being the voice, you know, that's asking these questions and asking people to talk about this. You asked me a couple of questions. Nobody's ever asked me. So I really appreciate that. I, it hey. was just great. Yeah, it was really great being here. You just have, I like, I like your approach to everything. And like you said, yeah. you're in the group. You're very conscious about what's going on. And I don't know how you do your job, be a mom, be a wife, uh, grieve <laughs> and do your job and do the writing. So I think you're amazing in everything Thank I've you. seen so far. And I think Thank you're going you. to do, <laughs> gonna do so great much. things for our grief community. You're it already was, doing them. This was really fun. This is really great. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate your voice out there. You know, we're all on the same team trying to do the same things, same hard thing. Thank you for sharing about John and Mary with me. It's been a pleasure. I think you have a lot more stories to share with us. So maybe, maybe in the group or maybe on, well, I just need to go to grief as my side hustle. And I will <laughs> I say there. everything I know. Thank you so much. Thank all right. Thank you. Right. We'll see Take you care. soon. Take care. Bye-bye. in Phoenix, Arizona. Find us on social media and any podcast platform. Music provided by Colin the Coco and the Revolving Birds. Studio provided by Fat Kid Productions. Check out one of the many shows available on our network. I'm your host, Stephanie Relaford. Thank you for listening to Parentless.